Uh, this is a quick talk about the dangers of running with scissors when carried by a rocket-propelled velociraptor. Okay, no, I just, um, this is actually probably the last reference to scissors in the entire thing, but never mind, it sounded like a good title. So, who am I? I'm uh, Tom, also known as TB Sliver. Uh, you'll find me like, on that, using that nickname everywhere online, pretty much. Yeah, everywhere online. Um, I'm a developer at Shadowcat Systems, uh, at, who work in Lancaster in the United Kingdom. or a software consultancy and work on a variety of back-end and front-end systems, and I generally also work on a lot of documentation and deployment parts. Uh, for clients and internal projects, for example, Shadow NMS. Um, I also helped with the uh, wiki improvements for the OpenNMS documentation team, uh, and also I have probably broken and abused OpenNMS a fair number of times, mostly because I misconfigured it. That's happened far too many times, actually. Ian's probably fixed more times on my, my failures on that. <laughs> so. What am I covering in this talk? Um, first part is Ansible, and the second part is how it works with OpenNMS. So, who doesn't know what OpenNMS is? <laughs> okay, so more seriously, um, who has heard of Ansible? Okay, who's used Ansible for anything? And who's actually used Ansible with OpenNMS? Shut up, you. Um, so, yeah, hopefully um, this will give you a good insight in uh, the way I've used it, and um, hopefully give you some tips and tricks for how to not break it so well that, as I did. So, Ansible. Uh, did I click twice then? Oh, whatever. Um, it's a deployment tool uh, similar to various other systems such as Puppet and Chef. However, it's a push-based one. So instead of it needing a daemon on the actual remote system, all it needs on it is Python 2.4 or above. Now, if you're running exactly Python 2.4, you're going to have a few issues, but that's covered in their documentation, so go read that. Um, so first bit, a couple of assumptions on what your system's like that you want to control with Ansible. Um, you can control anything, including Windows systems these days, I think. Um, but obviously to get, a basic to, to get a basic config, you know, need to know a couple of bits and pieces. So first bit is I'm using Debian 6 Wheezy, um, mainly because I know it quite well and it's still on long-term support for the next five years or something like that. Um, and I know a lot of the ins and outs of it, so yeah, may as well stick with that. Um, next one, Postgres 9.1. Main reason, it's in the Wheezy repos, so saves figuring, figuring out another repo. I could, you could upgrade it to 9.4 quite easily using what their official ones, but we'll stick with that. Um, we'll also be assuming you've got a Pris instance somewhere that this machine will be able to access for your actual provisioning. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. And we'll also assume you've got a full config directory in Git of your etc. open NMS. So all the XML configuration files you have in a Git repo, because that's a sensible option, because then you know when you've changed something by accident, or if open NMS has gone and changed something. Especially when you're deploying it like this, because anything could happen. Um, and the last part is you've got a dedicated machine for this, because Ansible is going to take full control of this. Uh, it can be a VM, it could be a bare metal box, doesn't actually matter. I did it on a VM for the testing of this. There we go. So, basics of Ansible. Um, there, are a couple of, there are four, five separate parts. Uh, first part is roles. Where have my notes gone? Never mind. I'm going to make this up on the spot. <sighs> da, da, da. Roles are basically little sections like uh, run, app, get, install, open NMS. That's, that's a simple role. Mine's called install open NMS. Um, normally nice, simple little bits all work in one little part, deploy against a specific item. The next part are playbooks, my notes are back, uh, which are a group of roles that then run against a specific hosts. It runs these in a particular order. And the next one is hosts. Uh, this is your list of machines, like, uh, done by either IP or hostname. Uh, it doesn't matter which, as long as you can get there, find them. Um, 
Group vars, which are variables that you can set in a more global fashion, um, and also group in terms of various other bits. I'll go over those in a second. And ad hoc commands. Ansible will also allow you to do straight ad hoc commands. So if you want to run a ping on every single server in your host file, you can do that with just a command line. Um, I'm not covering that. So let's have a look. All these files now are uh, from the Ansible config I used for this. So first up is hosts. Um, this is the basic structure of a host file. I had to do a new line there because otherwise we'd run out of screen. Um, you can see we've got a uh, IP address, a couple of variables set for that machine, and then a couple of extra variables that are set on that group. So say I had four or five machines in there in that top open NMS group, all of those would inherit the other vi variables in there. You could also set all the variables, you could also set requisition name and requisition URL in that bottom section. However, if you've got five or six different machines that you want to have different requisitions, that won't work. So, group variables are generally used for things that aren't specific to a host, more likely to be to, could be for a group or could just be for basic configuration. So, for example, I have the definition for the Ansible user in there, the UID, GID, name group comment, um, the SSH users who have access to that Ansible user, and a user list with everything including the password hash. That's not a complete password hash. The full one is in the Git repo if you want to try and hack it. It's ABC123. Right. So, playbooks. Um, there are four playbooks in this config. Uh, the first one is pre-install. This one does all the basic setup um, of the entire machine, so getting the initial user, in, the Ansible user installed, SSH keys, and sudo set up. Uh, next one's user maintenance. This is one you can run any time you make a change to a user, say password hash change, or adding a user, or changing who can actually access the Ansible user. Um, and the, the installing OpenNMS, which is the main one of this config. Uh, and the last one is change app repo, which I'm not covering because it didn't work properly. Um, so, and this is a quick insight on the playbook scripts that are in the repo as well. I'll give you the repo link at the end. Um, the actual command you run when you're running an Ansible playbook is this one here, ansible-playbook, I hosts playbook name. Um, these extra bits are just bits that automatically push it out to a log file um, in a custom path that's useful when you're debugging it. Because um, otherwise you end up with five miles of scroll back if you put on full verbose and you can't find it. So, pre-install. Um, this one's designed to set up the target machine with the very initial configurations. So, as you can see, straight name, pre-install settings, set to run against all hosts. So any machine listed in that host file that I showed earlier uh, will get this configuration pushed to it. Um, it's set to run as the user root and won't use sudo. Uh, this assumes on, if you've ever had a base Debian uh, install or Debian VM, you don't have sudo installed. You have su and that's it. Um, so the various roles we've got in here, uh, it's also got a list, list of all the roles and it does them in order. So it does the setting up the re Debian repo, um, a mini maintenance one called flush handlers, and then runs through sudo, setting up the user, setting up the SSK keys. So let's have a look at the main Debian repo setup. Um, you remember in the host file that in the overall variables, it had a openMS apt source string. This then gets inserted into the source string here which tells it which file to target in its, t in its um, files directory and then where to put it. So I've actually got th two, three, three Debian app repos set up, one which is the official UK one, one which is actually the ByteMark VM one, and one which is actually a apt mirror in the office just because that's quicker because we've got really bad internet. Um, what user group and uh, mode to put it on? And then it does an apt update afterwards. This is a custom 
So the notify bits are handlers that uh, you tell it to do something and it will do it eventually. Normally at the end of the, uh, at the, the Ansible run. However, uh, is it the next one? No, I didn't put it on there. Um, that maintenance flush handlers one actually flushes all the notifiers to happen then. So when it comes to the, when it comes to the next uh, the installing sudo, it's actually done an app get update because you know you've just changed your uh, apt repo. It's going to screw things up if you don't. So next one, set up the Ansible user. This is a bit of a long one. Um, sets up a group with the variables from the host from the group vars. Um, creates the user, and then grants passwordless sudo. So Ansible likes passwordless sudo. Um, you can do it with a passworded sudo, but it means you've got to type in your password every time, and if you're trying to maintain a machine with multiple people using the Ansible configs, that means you've got to share the password. Uh, I found it better to just lock down the machine to have SSH access only with key, and then that user, you can only access that user with an authorized key. So the next step after this, so obviously it puts it in the uh, etc. sudo as uh, .d folder, so it gets included in. Um, and I didn't actually show the code, but it's a simple. It's if you've ever done passwordless sudo or configuration of a sudo file. Uh, you'll recognize the syntax on it. So next one is um, installing all the SSH keys. So what it does is it uses the Ansible SSH users variable in the group bars to figure out the list of all the names of the users and then pulls it out of a directory in the root of this uh, Ansible config. Yes, it's five layers deep. Um, called pub keys with your username dot pub, easiest way to store it, um, and installs it on the Ansible user. Um, final one is the setup with the SSH D. SSHD. Um, this does a basic regex on the file itself, changes it to disallow root login, and uh, to turn off password authentication. So you have to use an SSH key. So if you've not set up an SSH key in this and you manage to get this far, you lock yourself out of your machine and you've got to get the root console again. Um, however, it's just undo those two and it all works again. Uh, I have done that several times. <laughs> Last thing it does is restart the SSH daemon. And so we're on to the user maintenance one. So user maintenance is a basic one that then runs, similar to the pre-install one, but this one runs directly as the Ansible user which has sudo access. So this is the, the previous one you'd have to run and type in your password to get it to work. Um, but after that, you don't need it. You can just run these straight off as long as you've got your SSH key set up. So two roles in this. Set up the SSH keys, which we saw previously. And then the maintenance slash users one, which is here. And this one's very simple, actually. Uh, actually, no, it's not. It's two parts. I can't see my own, my own uh, slides. Um, so first it does, it creates the group you define for the user, and then sets up the actual user with all the variables, and it actually loops through a full list of them. So you can actually set up 1, 10, 500 people in there. 500 would take a while, uh, and it will create all those, put them, in the right use, put them in the right groups, put them with the right users, give them the right password, and then install the SSH key for them as well. So that means that your entire setup just ends up as a run this once, done. Uh, I've actually used this setup up to this point for initial bootstrap of systems that aren't going to have any app that Ansible's going to be using, Ansible's going to be controlling, but is quite a quick way to go from nothing to all your major sysadmins and uh, developers actually have access to the system. It takes about mm, five minutes, depending on the number of users. So now on to the main meat of this uh, 
Ansible config, the actual installation of OpenNMS. Now, there's a lot of little random bits that took a little bit of config, bleh, took a little bit of work to get them to work just right. So, again, that's the uh, actual playbook. Um, and so I'm going to go through each of these roles and step, apart from, I don't think I'll go through the flush handlers again because it's one line. So, first one, installing tools. This one just straight off installs each of the part and parts listed in the with items just as a app get install, git, app state get install devconf utils. Um, devconf utils is actually needed by Ansible <laughs> later on to do part of the configuration. So some of the parts that Ansible does requires certain things installed on the target system. So for, um, if you're using devconf bits, I think, I can't remember the other ones that require um, extra things installed, but say if you wanted to actually run an, a, it's the same as saying you want to run an SQL statement against it, you have to have Postgres or MySQL already installed anyway. Uh, and Vim, because it's the best editor. Q Flame War. No. Um, next one is to set up open, uh, the OpenNMS apt repo. Um, this actually also includes the ability, it actually pulls down the app key, as you always have to do, um, or checks, it, checks it's present in this case, um, and will download it if it needs it, and then installs the app repository. Now, I've actually got a, uh, yep, I actually show the variables. Um, this is a fun one that I, it took me a while to figure out how to actually have multiple one, multiple app sources defined so I could have multiple um, targets. So in the host file, it's actually got office underscore 16 set as the app source. This is just then so it mirrors through the office one. However, you could also set it up so if you had, if so in the variables one, which is this one, you can see that's the office variable one that points to us through our local mirror. Um, straight to debian.openms.org. But if you wanted to, you could say have default underscore 14 if you had to install OpenMS 14 or 12 or whatever. You could just set a separate variable, set it in the host file, and it will install that version on that machine for you. So the next fun one, Oracle Java. How we love thee. Um, the biggest trick with this one is actually getting it to accept the Oracle license automatically for you, which is why you needed the devconf installed earlier. Now, this one caused me a few headaches because Ansible actually supports bare name uh, booleans in the, in the actual roles. So you'll notice that value is actually a quoted true. That's because if you put bare word true, it puts a capital letter at the front of it and the devconf fails. <laughs> but it doesn't fail in the way you'd expect. It lets you put that variable in as a Boolean with a capital T. <laughs> so devconf does not do type checking on the inputs. That took about an hour for me to figure out because then I had to go learn how to use devconf properly. Um, that was really annoying. Um, but yeah, so that one line will install Oracle Java 8 without any intervention because it normally asks for how it needs an interactive uh, installer to actually run that. So, and then I've missed my next button, sorry. And the next part is to just install Oracle Java 8. That's nice and simple. There's nothing really much to that. So, Postgres. Postgres has a couple of little parts to it. The first one is really simple, install Postgres 9.1. And this will also update it if there was ever a patch update to this because it's using state latest. You could just say, uh, with all these apt ones, if you see state latest, you could also do state present where it will install it if it needs it and then not update it, but only uh, basically only install if it is not installed. It will not do an update. It's quite useful if you're uh, after specific versions, or you don't want to just suddenly upgrade all the Postgres instances on all your machines at once, you want to go in and do it manually, because if you've got like 30 of them, your entire infrastructure might just go kaput. 
if one of the installs fails. So, uh, part two is a bit more fun. This is setting up the PGHBA config. Um, this actually regexes over the PGHPA config, sets up the local host, uh, the local, the link local? No. The local, the uh, local host ones to the variables you need, to, you need for this. It actually replaces the configs in there. Um, you could modify it so it doesn't, but as this is the only thing on there, it's actually probably fine. Um, you could also set up specifically for the OpenNMS user. Um, in fact, I'm not sure why I didn't do that. Improvements. Pull requests welcome, by the way. Um, and then it just restarts Postgres after that. So, the next one is the config repo. So this is the configuration repo that has uh, your etc. OpenNMS files in. Um, all the things like provision D requisition and notifications.xml, that sort of lot. Um, so you keep them all very secure. Uh, not secure, up to date. So this will actually pull out a Git repo, put it in my home there, set the branch, um, update it if it needs to, and also accept host key. Um, you could actually put the uh, host key in for that accept host key, so uh, FE08 colon whatever. Um, unfortunately, it's pointing to GitHub and I don't know what their host keys are because they rolled around in the mud. Um, next thing it does is just do a straight symlink to the open etc. OpenMS from the OpenMS folder inside there. Um, as OpenMS runs as root, it doesn't matter what what um, user settings you've got on those files, it can still read them and still edit them as it needs. So at least in this way, you can actually see if it's done anything like stupid, like put a timestamp in the file that it doesn't need to touch. So uh, part two is one of the more interesting parts. So you could just have your provision D requisition, sorry, yeah, provision D configuration in there, set as needed and point directly to the Pris instance or another OpenNMS instance, I think, it support, I think you can do as well. Yeah, um, or any of the other options you can do in there. But in the, as you saw in the original host file, I had requisition URL and requisition name set in there. So what you can do is obviously set up your Pris instance to have that one there. This will... This, instead of, the problem with um, Ansible is, it wants to keep all your config files and template files in the repo, the Ansible config. Now, you could combine the two and have the OpenMS just install without a config repo underneath it, but that, get, that again comes an issue if it changes something and you don't know about it, and you spin up another VM and delete that one and it has, and you forget to change or something. This way, it actually pulls it out of the remote machine, puts it in a special folder that's actually a basically a local temp folder, and then re-implements it using the host name of the actual host to find it again. Uh, it's just the way that it stores it when you use a fetch command. Um, and then re-puts it out in the correct place. Um, and this is the actual, this is the part of the template that actually gets inserted. So the uh, Ansible uses Ginger 2, yes, Ginger 2 um, syntax for all its data, all its data replacing. So the re requisition name and requisition URL inside the two curly braces will uh, be replaced with the values you set on your host. So when you have 50 hosts, for example, in your uh, Ansible host config, um, it will then fill that out for each individual host with the separate config you set for them. Um, you could also put the cron schedule out. I left that in because it's, I'll leave that up as a, uh, sorry, I'll leave that open as a uh, thing for the uh, readers. One sec. So, the last part is the actual install of OpenNMS. 
And you'd think that would be nice and simple. However, anyone who's hand, anyone who's hand installed OpenNMS will know there are several things you need to do afterwards in the right order and only when you first install it or update it. So the actual app install is just does the app get in, app, app get install OpenNMS from the target repo you set earlier. But then obviously you've got to set up the Java, set up the database, set install IP like properly, and then actually get the darn thing started. So these are all the handlers that actually do all the various parts of that. And they're actually, it's actually really simple. You can just put a command in for that. Just throw the command straight in. And when it does an update, it will, so for, so for example, if it, if it updated Java to a new version, actually this would fail. Oops. Um, so if it didn't update the Java to the uh, standard user bin Java, you'd actually have an issue there. But you could change this and put this on the uh, Oracle Java installer and get it to set up J the Java link as well. Um, sets the install, does the install of the actual um, schema change, any schema changes, uh, sets up IP like properly, and then starts it. And if anyone's ever run OpenNMS, a OpenNMS startup from a script, they know that it actually errors out when you start it. So you have to put the ignore errors yes on there, and then it will just completely ignore if it craps out. So you know when when you do a service OpenNMS restart, it comes back and it says OpenNMS is. Uh, has start, is starting but has not finished starting up and then returns you back to your shell. That's actually a, a uh, error exit on that. Um, I don't know if that's actually meant to happen as an error. Is it meant to happen? <laughs> right. This had an issue on a 64 gig four core machine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Probably. Um, you could put ignore, well, if you put ignore errors, no, that's the default, at which point the um, entire Ansible config crashes out for that machine. So if any of the uh, configuration parts actually fails, then it will stop working on that machine at that point. So if you've, got 50, if you've got 50 machines defined and five of them can't install Postgres for some stupid reason, then those five machines will stop at that point. They'll just, they'll, it'll show you errors at the end um, that you had. And then obviously, you'd go back through your logs and double check which one it was that actually died. Um, if you set that there, it is the last thing it runs, but it technically means that your config failed. And you may not know if the OpenMS properly started up. Um, you could probably do a second test on making sure it's started. But actually, I think when you do state it was started with Ansible, it checks if it's started rather than restarted. So if it's actually already running, it won't do anything. That should probably be restart, actually, because if you do an install, you need to restart it, don't you? If you do an update to OpenNMS. Yes. Oops. Right. Right then. So let's have a that space, that's the entire thing. That's the entire config. So do we have any questions so far about that config? Or are you, all your brain's going, oh, that's a lot of data. No questions? Stun silence? OK, I'll go for stun silence. Right, so speed. Manually installing OpenNMS on a VM or a laptop, how long does it normally take? You've got a question. I've got one minute. Awesome. I think I'm almost there. OK, very quick question. How long do you think it would take? How long do you think it takes you to install OpenMS manually? That's from a bare VM, as this machine does. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. I'm, I'm going to take his answer as rope, because he's probably done it multiple times. Anyone else? Ian gave me a number of about a day. Although that does include going all provision derequisition and all that. So yeah, that includes all the config files setting. Um, yeah. Ansible, when you've, got a when you've either got local repos or decent bandwidth, say a VM, say a machine in the, out in the wild, um, I ran this on this machine, and it did it in 17 minutes. 
that's zero to open NMS installed and running with your, default, with your custom config in 17 minutes. So if you have a custom, in, custom setup you need or want, you could just quickly edit the, uh, repo, the Git repo on your local machine in your favorite editor because XML hates you, um, and then deploy it straight off. 17 minutes. Right then, so where to find it? Uh, it's all on GitHub. Um, the Ansible config is at tbsliver slash OUC2015 Ansible config. It's a nice long name, so you can't forget it. Uh, and the actual OpenNMS config files are there. That includes a branch called OpenNMS 16 original, which is the files as they come from a default OpenNMS install. So if you want to, if you want to fork that and use that as a base for any of your configs, feel free. Or just you know, download a tarball of it. I don't mind. Um, where to find me? GitHub.com slash tbsliver is my GitHub account. Um, I am at tbsliver on Twitter. And you'll find me in hash open and mess on Freenode under the name tbsliver. And it's tbsliver, not silver. <laughs> the number of people that get that wrong is impressive. Thank you. Any questions? What's the difference between liberator and liberator? The hardest part? Um, getting the Postgres PGHBA to not hate me because of the nature of the PGHBA, it's a fall through system. Um, and I think op the OpenNMS config wants it first, if I remember rightly. It has to, does it have to be? I think it has to be above the, the default config. Um, and it took me a while to get a regex that worked on the default H PGHBA, would replace the lines, and not constantly put the flipping things at the end every time you ran the config. At one time I looked in my thing, I had 20 lines in there. So that was probably the most annoying um, of all of them. Um, Ian? Neither does mine. Oh. I'm using a wireless mouse that uses the dongle, but do you want to borrow the mouse? Okay. Okay. Right. No more questions? <laughs>